Okay, today on our Titan Leader Talks, we have defensive coordinator from Miami, uh, John Hauser. John, thanks for being here with us. It's great to be here, Brent. All right, let's say look at your resume. It, it's pretty impressive. Um, you know, you've gone from being a Division three football player and you've kind of climbed the ranks and, you know, now you're a defensive coordinator at a Division one program. You guys are MAC champs. I mean, uh, you know, what advice would you give someone who has that aspiration of being a Division one college coach? Like what steps can they take to uh, do the same thing that you did? Yeah, I think it's it's a pretty simple outlook. I think you've got to – you got to try to get in somewhere. I think being a graduate assistant is huge. Um, but I think your first job is, is key. You just got to get somewhere and you got to work hard. It sounds kind of cliche ish. Um, but I think the more people you're around, I was very fortunate when I quit playing at Wittenberg, I got done. Um, I had a little bit of a connection at Northern Illinois university and, uh, Scott Schaefer brought me up there. He knew my head coach from, from Wittenberg, which is a, is a great program um, that, that had a lot of connections, which helped me out a ton, um, brought me in. I started out as a video guy, uh, so GA video back when there was only a few GAs on every staff and then moved into the defensive role the next year and then got fortunate in a couple of years. Our, our um, defensive back coach left, and I had done a good job as a graduate assistant. I just, you know, again, I just worked hard and tried to, tried to do things for the coaches that, that made me valuable. Um, you know, didn't matter who it was. I always tried to do a good job, be thorough. I was, I was great to learn from some of those guys because some of the stuff I did wasn't great. And they told me and I, and I did it better. So I think it's, I think it is just keep your head down and, and work really hard. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of people getting into coaching maybe for, I don't, I don't know what reason, but, but it has to be what's your why. I mean, my why was always about helping kids be successful in life, um, which is, is what we do as coaches. So at the end of the day, it didn't really matter where I was at. I was all about trying to help kids, you know, be great football players and be great citizens. And, uh, you know, when you, when you do that and you work for great people, I was lucky to be surrounded by great guys in Northern Illinois, my first job. And then, you know, again, our head coach retired and had to find a job and then landed at Wayne State in Detroit and, and worked for a great staff there, worked for a great coach in Paul Winter. So um, just been been fortunate um, to have some success in my career. And uh, just, again, uh, you never know who's going to help you in this business. So um, especially the people that you think are, are good, keep a relationship with them. Um, people, you recruit their school, you know. I mean, all those relationships are important. It's such a relationship type business and not only with your players, but with, with coaches as well, always staying in touch with guys um, has, has kind of helped me get to, to Miami at this point with Chuck. Gotcha. So, um, you know, the first topic that we wanted to hit was being an elite assistant coach. So, you know, you mentioned doing things for people. So, um, you know, we have a previous interview with Coach Martin, your head coach. And, and so how do you um, kind of embrace his um, mantra or his vision or, you know, whatever you want to call it? How do you embrace that and then make sure that it shows up in your position group or for you, the entire defense? Yeah, I think, I think coach Martin is so crystal clear with what he wants. Um, it, it's a big benefit as an assistant coach to have a head coach that's so defined in what he's looking for. Um, I've been places where it's not like that. And I think the communication between the head coach, Coach Martin, and the assistants is so crystal clear that it's really not a difficult thing to install in our meeting rooms. Um, I've, I've always been pretty much on board for what, what Chuck believes in. He's got such a, a good vision and outline of what he wants his program to look like, that there's, there's not a ton of gray. Um, he's, not, he's open to, to ideas and things all the time, but when you walk in your meeting room, and I've always believed this to my core, just like him, like we have to be on the same page as a, as a position group, as a side of the ball. Um, he talks all the time about, um, 
you know, we're going to, we're going to win games 50 to 50 to 48 and we're going to win games 10 to seven and don't point the finger at the other side of the ball and all those things. And really I was fortunate as a young coach, like I saw that stuff happen firsthand and I, I kind of understood how, how bad that is for a program. So all those things that he talked about last week, as far as just building a culture, um, going into your meeting room and, and you have a clear picture for what you want your, your position group to look like. And that fits into the defensive culture and the, the team culture of, of the team. And, and we don't have a ton of rules on our team. We don't have a ton of mantras and sayings, but one thing he talks about all the time is be a great teammate. And there's a couple things like that, that we talk about that if you really just think about it and, if you're a great teammate, you know, that, that almost encompasses everything these guys are talking about. So um, we don't, we don't have a ton of things. It's just, you know, how do you treat people? You know, what's your, is your room on board? And, and like he says, like, if there's an issue in your room, it's, it's probably coming from you. So um, we've been fortunate too. We've been together for six years. So I, I hadn't worked with coach Martin before this stop at Miami, but, we're one of the few staffs in the country that has most of the guys that he hired back in 2014 when he took this job are, are still on the staff. And then we got a couple of great additions, but um, just the overall message from the top makes it honestly pretty easy for my job, just because it is a crystal clear picture of, of what we want. And that's not, you know, we, we sit down in meetings a lot and we discuss, you know, what is great defense and, and we, we all basically come to the same conclusion and, Again, I'm always – I might not agree with exactly what he thinks, but I'm not going to go in that meeting room and tell those kids that you have to be on board with with what the culture and what the, the point is from the top. And it's honestly been something that's easy for me because I, I understand how important that is in leadership. And um, that's that's kind of our – what we talk about a lot. Um, so, you know, one time I heard his presentation, they said the goal of the head coach – is to like knock down roadblocks, right? So that the assistants can just coach, right? But then the main job of the assistant coach is to make the head coach's job easier, right? So right. what are some things that you do to help your head coach's job be easier? Um, I think the, the main thing is just trying to hold my guys to a high standard and the standard that he set as as the leader um i think handling these kids you know he's got a hundred guys to worry about right now he's trying to you know talk to all these guys i got i got seven or eight so uh, my communication with them on a daily basis of just you know academically making sure that they're on top of their stuff it's just basically knowing your room and your players inside and out and what's going on in their lives because as a head coach it, it's impossible to to know the ins and outs of every player. And then, you know, a, a big thing for me is just developing that trust with your players where they are going to come to you with issues. They are going to talk to you about things that are going on in their life, which, um, you know, now Chuck is, Chuck is probably different than some head coaches. I'm not sure. He wants to know what's going on with our kids. That's the first thing we, we talk about in our staff meeting every day is what's going on with the players. Is there any issues? anything coming up? How's, how's their home life? Like what's going on? So he's very much um, involved with our players on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's from, he recruited all of them. He knows their families, uh, which is important. So again, the nice thing about him is he's always willing to, to come in and, and, you know, meet with our kids. And if I got an issue that I think that needs the head coach's attention, I have no reservation about, telling him, Hey, I think this kid needs to talk to you about this. And, and he's on it, but I think just filtering some of that stuff. So he's not dealing with a hundred guys issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And then understanding the difference between, Hey, this is, this is something that the head coach can help me with. Um, I think that's important as well. I think I used to, as a coach, just try to handle my room and not bother the head coach with anything. And I think a few years ago, we, we talked as a staff even about just, Hey, you know, our head coach has a relationship with these guys. Like if there's an issue you might not think it's big, but we need to talk about things on a day-to-day -day basis and, and get him involved. And I think that's been key as well. I think 
just again, the communication of, you know, being able to tell your head coach what's going on and, and sometimes letting him decide like, Hey, this is going on Chuck. And, and he'll say, Hey, okay, I'll, I'll give the kid a call and, and letting him decide some of that stuff. I think as an assistant, sometimes you try to filter all that and handle it yourself. So you're handling your room. And I think you, you make a mistake of not involving the head coach. So that's something that I think you're, you're a head coach, Brent, you understand that. Like you can't have every issue coming across your desk, but, you also want to know what's going on and be briefed on it. Cause I think there's certain times that the head coach can be more beneficial than a position coach at times. Yeah, absolutely. You got, got to kind of find that balance in there for sure. Um, all right. So let's switch to like in game culture because uh, you know, I think we all, we all come up with this plan and we're all using this time and practice and, and we kind of instill it, but if it doesn't show up, right on game day then you know you're not doing it right okay um so i've, I've been to a couple of miami games i've seen you're on the sideline are you, you going to be on sideline again this year yeah i would assume right now i wouldn't be yeah all right so defensive coordinators always seem to want to be on the field right and i think it part of it is because they like to feel the flow of the game right, and kind of be a motivating factor and stuff like that. So what are some things that you do as a, as a coach to kind of motivate your team in the game? Um, I, think, I think in game, we, are, we try to be very positive with our guys. Um, I think that's one thing, that, and that comes straight down from the top, Coach Martin, just, you know, we put a lot of time into the week of preparation. We expect our players to put a lot of time into the week of preparation. And then we want to, especially on, on defense, I just think it's so different than offense. Um, you can't play with any reservations. You don't know exactly what's coming. So it's such a reactionary uh, spot to play defense. So, and, and the offense is always going to do something that you haven't practiced. So, and, and I think talking about that stuff before the game is important. Like, you know, instead of getting in the game and they do something different, like we talk to our players all the time about that. They're going to do something that we got to adjust to, like expect it, you know. And I think kids and coaches in general just, you know, there's going to be the unexpected. Obviously, longevity and working with people helps with the communication of that. Um, but we try to be on game day. We are super positive. We try to be super organized on the sideline, have our players – in certain areas, they know when they come off the field, they got to sit here on the bench and, and we get together as a staff and just hit the things that we need to be emphasizing as a defense, you know, as a whole. Um, but getting them organized on the sideline and having a, a clear, concise communication with them. And then, you know, the players, some of the players have good input. Some players that haven't played a much, a lot may not have as much input, but that's all developed through the week by practicing and you've went over this in the film and then they see it on the field and you can communicate that's going on right now with our guys understanding formations and understanding past concepts. And that's not the communication part doesn't just happen magically on, on Saturdays or Friday nights. It's, it's built through the week. It's built in the off season with, with kids understanding what's your language, what's your, how do you talk about offense? Like, and, and being able to communicate that on the sideline is super important, but we want our kids to play confident. We want our kids to play fast. We're not the, we don't, we don't, we don't want a thousand schemes. Um, we want to be positive with them because we want to play with confidence, belief in themselves, belief in the system. And I think that's, that's shown up for us defensively the last few years is just, you know, be positive on game day. We're going to get on. If, if we don't think they're playing hard, we're going to get on them. If, if we're not making plays and the offense has made a couple more plays, hey, we got to make the next play. That's our mentality on game day is we're going to make the next play. If we didn't make the last one, we're going to make the next one. But never getting too high, never getting too low, staying even keel and understanding there's a flow to the game. There's going to be good and bad and talking about that beforehand. I think kids are way better when you talk about stuff beforehand than you get in a game and – uh, like, well, you didn't think they were gonna they they were, they were gonna have a thirty yard play or a fifty yard play. Like we knew this was gonna happen. All right, prepare for it and adjust and and move on. But next play mentality, positive on the sideline unless they're not playing hard, and uh, just 
you know, try to try to keep those guys involved and organized. All right. So you kept mentioning the week leading up to the game and coach Martin said, he thinks you guys design practice where you have more 11 on 11 football or team situations than almost anyone in the country. So uh, maybe tell us, how do you use those team or full 11 on 11 scenarios um, to help prepare your guys? Yeah, I think, I think we start out on a Tuesday. I mean, this is going to be kind of more football specific schematic probably, but on a Tuesday, we're trying to, we're trying to rep the plays that we think the offense is best at and the things they do that we know they're going to do week in and week out and get our guys familiar with it and understand like, these are the plays that we need to stop in order for us to be successful and, and really just rep them to the different calls we have. And I think one of the benefits of our defense is we're, we're, we're a one high defense. We're going to play a couple coverages. We're going to play a little bit of cover two and we're going to blitz a little bit. And, and again, we're, we're keeping it pretty simple. So for us, um, I think the advantageous thing we have with our simple scheme is that we're studying the offense like crazy every week. Our players, they know how to play cover three. Now it's about, okay, what is the offense doing with this split? What is, what does it mean when the quarterback um, is lined up here or the, the running backs lined up here? What the offensive lineman stance, like when you're simple on defense, I think you can get into a lot of that stuff. And, and Tuesday really is just a general, you know, we're going to throw a lot of stuff at them and we're going to get it on film and there's going to be a bunch of mistakes. And I've always believed that, you know, sometimes it, it, it's good to make mistakes in practice. Like I'm going to, we're going to throw deep balls. Um, we have some run plays where, you know, our corners are playing man and it, it's a run play. We're working a run fit, but our corners are playing man. So they're looking at their receiver. We have another quarterback throw the ball there so they can get a rep. Um, so just trying to take advantage of all the reps and then, and then coming back on Wednesday, and really trying to zero in on, okay, this is what our guys don't understand. It's, it's a review day, but in football, you got to keep moving ahead. We're going to do third down, which for us is kind of a different, different thing. We're going to do more stuff on third down. It's critical to get stops on third down. So we're going to emphasize it on Wednesday and Thursday, and then adding the red zone piece to it on Wednesday and Thursday. But I mean, and then we're going to have a, a big walkthrough on Friday before the game. Like we, we have a walkthrough, on Saturdays before the game, like we're never, we're never could be prepared enough. Like we're, we're always trying to get an extra play in, um, always trying to show them a rep and not, not the one hitters or the things that, you know, you can't really control, but, but what they do bread and butter, figuring that out and trying to get our guys to understand those things is the, is the biggest thing for us. And then, for us, I mean, there's a lot of onus on our kids. We have 20 hours a week to work with them. So it, there's a lot of time that they need to spend on their own watching film to get themselves prepared. And I think we, we got in a situation where some of our best players are our best prepared guys. And, and that when, when you get that going, it just trickles down through your system. And, um, you know, that's been, it's been a lot of hard work to get to that point, but that's kind of where we're at now is our, some of our best players are our most prepared guys. And, our young guys see that and they want to, they want to prepare like those guys. So that's, that's big, but playing 11 on 11 football, trying to segment it early in the week. So, you know, not just running a bunch of random plays, but kind of segmenting it by personnels and formations. And so the kids can kind of see it back to back and over and over again. And then later in the week, starting to mix it up some and, and make it a little harder, even in the Friday walkthrough, just giving them some looks that, you know, are a little tougher reviewing the basics and then making sure that we're, we're trying to be prepared for what they do well. Gotcha. Um, all right. So shift, shifting back to the in-game stuff. Um, so as the defensive coordinator, you probably rely on, you know, multiple guys on your staff to relay information to you. Um, and in, in the, the modern day football, it has to happen very, very quickly. Right. So, how do you guys, um, I guess, establish your communication protocol? And, like, what, what does that look like? Right. So our, our head coach is on defense. So he's, he's the one that's usually calling it at times. Our co-coordinator, Spence Nowinski, um, kind of handles the front seven. Then me and Bill Breakin work with the back end. So I think 
our, our head coach, uh, when we, when we get off the field, um, I think we usually have a pretty good idea of what we're trying to get done adjustment wise, but he usually makes sure that we understand what we need to get done adjustment wise. And again, if, if he wasn't there, we'd have, you know, somebody needs to set the tone for, Hey, this is what we got to get done, you know, continuing on the game and making adjustments. And then, you know, understanding when we get to the bench, like your players having your, your starters on the bench, the, the backups are behind them. Um, and then just explaining to the kids what's going on and, and what's happening. But our communication, me and our safeties coach usually get together on the headset um, in between series. And he tells me what he's seeing. I tell him what I'm seeing and we get on the same page and um, either I'll talk to his players. We'll, we'll, we'll get the secondary together. Secondary's, Obviously important that all those guys are on the same page, the safeties, the corners, the nickels, and then we'll kind of go by position. Our linebacker coach, Coach Nowinski, our co-coordinator will talk to them. EJ Whitlaw, our D-line coach, talks to the D-line, and we kind of get our segments squared away on an individual basis, what they need to do. And then, you know, as a group, just to me, you don't have time sometimes. You just got to, you got to get the individual guys and then, the leadership on the defense shows up with the players, you know, get those guys talking to each other in between series, um, understanding what they got to do. But the communication, you know, again, comes from the top down, understanding it. And again, you can always, we always, we all have input. It's through the preparation all week. We, we understand kind of our own scheme and what they're trying to do. And just being on the same page is, is huge, obviously on the sideline. Um, Okay, so with adjustments, I think as a, as a coach, we always struggle with the idea of do we trust our game plan that we've like had in and we've put in all week, or do we make this adjustment in the game based on something? So in your mind, what justifies kind of veering away from the game plan a little bit and making an adjustment or, you know, versus just saying, hey, that was a one-time deal, we're, we're still good. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, on defense, if it's hurting you, you got to adjust to it. So if the plan we had during the week isn't working and there's a, there's a scheme-specific thing that, you know, we know that the puzzle pieces aren't aligned right and there's an issue, we're going to get it corrected. And I think – you know, the game plan's out the window if, if they're doing something that, that we didn't anticipate or that we are not able to stop in our some of our base stuff, then, then we're going to adjust and go to it. I think, again, the good thing for us is we're pretty simple, and our base defense is pretty good against everything if guys do their job. So um, there, there are some tweaks, obviously, that you, that you got to have um, – depending on what the offense is doing and things. But um, I would say if, if it's a schematic thing that you can control as a coach, you got to get your kids in the best position they can be in and you got to adjust and, and change the plan if you have to. Now you got to change it to a plan that the kids understand and something that you've done. You can't just obviously come up with something that, that they don't understand and can execute. But I would say if, if it's something schematically that you can't handle and your kids, you know, it's some, an issue, you got to change it and, and throw out the game plan. I mean, and adjust. Right. So you mentioned simple schemes. So, um, you know, how do you establish those simple schemes to be universal? You know, because right now when we're not in a game, right, like, uh, you know, some people do if-then statement. Some people say, you know, they, they have answers built for every scenario or every formation or whatever it might be. So when you guys sit down as a defensive staff and you say, okay, we're going to be a, a, a one-high team or whatever it might be, uh, what do you guys do now to help you in the game to handle all those different if thens or scenarios or whatever you want to call them? Yeah, I think that um, you know, again, our scheme is it's pretty basic and it's able to be adapted to offenses every week. And we can, again, we're gonna we're gonna put a lot of work into understanding what they do well and and 
you know, our cover three isn't, it isn't the same cover three probably every week like most people. So uh, we are going to tweak it here and there and try to take away what the offense does well, I think is, is the best way I could without right now. I think for us, it's just understanding football in the big picture. Like I think too many times, um, defensive guys are so worried about what they're trying to do that, you know, they don't understand what the offense is trying to do. And, and I think when you're simple on defense and there's not a thousand things that they got to be thinking about and you can focus more on the offense, you can get that out of your players. And that's kind of what we're trying to do now is just, we always are trying to educate our, our players on studying the offense and studying what they do. And is this a tell? And that's our job as coaches and, and the players come up with them that tells every week of what, what can help us in this situation. But I think for us, the, the complexity we can have in our defense is, is a benefit of not having a ton of calls, being, being simple, but we put the onus on, we're going to be complex in knowing your offense. And that's where we're going to spend our time is because I don't got to think about 10 checks pre-snap. Now we're going to, we're going to have some adjustments and things that our safety has got to handle and formationally. And if they can get us in a good call, um, we're going to get into that good call. But I think not, not giving the kids too much stuff and being able to understand the offense and how they're attacking us is the biggest thing um, that where you can benefit from that. If you're doing a bunch of stuff on defense and you're just trying to get lined up, which nowadays on, on in defense, I mean, it is, it's, it's tough to get lined up pre-snap. Like we, we sit there and, you know, you're breaking down a team and they got 50 formations with, with 20 motions. And, you know, you got to be really cognizant of what you're putting on the plate of your defensive players. Like if we're going to adjust, we're going to adjust one way that week. Like we're not going to have seven different ways we adjust to a, to a formation. You got to be really cognizant on, because just getting lined up in defense, I believe is half the battle, like with on certain, certain teams that, that you play, you know, they're going fast and you're trying to get lined up and you're trying to get a call in and, you know, taking, taking some of the complexity out of it and just being able to get lined up is we, we say that all the time. Like if we can get lined up guys and have our eyes in the right place when the ball snap with some of these tempo teams, you know, we're going to, we can win this game. Now on top of that, you know, you've got to play defensively with crazy effort. you got to run to the ball. And those are the things that we talk about that are, that are tangible that you can see, like running to the ball, having intent when you get to the football, talking about takeaways. Like those are the things that, that we can talk about as well as just studying the offense and really understanding what they do because we know where we line up. Like we know how we're going to adjust if this guy moves. But you've got you've to gotta get your guys prepared for that in the offseason and – obviously the weeks leading up to the game and make it simple enough to where they can function and play fast at a high level with a lot of moving parts on defense. All right, coach, last question. It's Brad Birchfield's favorite. Okay. Um, so you, you recruit all over the country. Uh, you know, you, you've been into all these different high schools, you know, take, take athletic ability out of it. But like when you walk into a building, what are some of the things that you see where you're like, man, this is an elite program? Yeah, I think it's, I think, I think a lot of times it's how the kids, you know, look you in the eye and, and shake your hand and talk to you. I mean, that's, that's big. I mean, if, if you walk in and, and a kid kind of looks down and, and he's not making eye contact with you and, you know, he's not real, real sure of himself, like that's, that's an immediate red flag to me. Like the kids that, that stick their chest out, shake your hand and, and say hello to you. Um, you know, that's, that's huge. The kids that, you know, they have a, they have a program where, you know, they're going to be in the weight room at two thirty every day. Like there's not, it's not, Oh, well, you know, you know, he, he wasn't here today or whatever. Like you go in their weight room, and there's, there's numerous guys working out and you can tell that they're, they got a plan. Like they're not, they're not uh, walking around talking to people. They got a plan and they're efficient with their time. Um, when you walk in the weight room, that's probably the biggest, the biggest indicator you stand there, you're talking to the head coach and you're looking around and, 
and everybody's working. There's not, there's not a faction of guys over in the corner, um, hanging out, you know, doing something different. You look in the room and the best players are in there working the hardest. That's, that's to me is a great indicator when, because a lot of the guys we go to see are the best players on the team. And are they, are they looking over at me every two seconds or are they, are they working out, you know, with their teammates, trying to push their teammates? You can tell when a kid is, is in the weight room trying to help his teammates out. And when they're in the weight room, worried about themselves, you know, doing their own thing. And I think to, to answer your question, maybe the best is the guys that are the best players, when you see them in the weight room and you see them working out with their team and you can tell that they're trying to help their teammates to become better. Like that to me is when you probably got a really special program um, with, with good players that are going to be able to um, be successful. All right, coach. Well, we appreciate your time. Um, <clears throat> If you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out our other content. Every Thursday night, we release a coach's interview at 7 p.m.